Brother Bennett said, I'm not introducing you this morning. What did I do to him? How did I offend him? <laughs> he said, no. He says, now that you've preached here a few times, I'm not going to introduce you anymore. And that's why I like preaching here. I got introduced. That was the good part about it. <laughs> Acts chapter 11, if you'll turn your Bibles, Acts 11. It's good to see all of you here this morning. Thank you for being faithful and coming. And we pray that it will be profitable for us as we uh, look to God's Word. We are now participating in, in what the, our brethren in the past have done since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we get to gather and sing and praise and testify. And we get to look to God's words and be reminded of those things that He has taught us. All right, are you there? Say amen. Why don't you stand with me, Will? We're going to read one verse and then we're going to get into the message. Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11, and we're reading, um, reading here about Barnabas, and Barnabas has um, departed to Tarshish. Barnabas is looking for Saul, and Barnabas is going to take Saul, who later becomes the Apostle Paul, and he's going to take him down to Antioch, and they'll, they'll, they'll be there, I think, for two years, and minister, because there's, there's a, a swelling of converts that... Uh, have been brought into there in Antioch and a great need for discipling and leadership and training and so forth. And, and Barnabas uh, determined that Paul or Saul was the, the person that needed to help him with this. And so that's where we are. In verse number 26 it says, And, and when he found him, that's Paul, he brought him to Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Let's have prayer. Father, we are grateful for your words and we ask that you would anoint the time that we have. We know your words are anointed. And we know that you promised us that if we gather in your name, by two or three, that you would be here with us. And so we, we claim that and believe that wherever you are, that, Lord, there always will be a change with us. And so please help us. Help us to set aside those things in our mind of activities or problems or condemnation, perhaps, that we, we embrace and set it aside and allow your spirit to work in our hearts and mine included, Father. We thank you for being so good and faithful to us. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Acts chapter 11, as we have just read, Paul and Barnabas spend a year there and they're discipling all these many converts that have been brought into the church. And then a statement is made here, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. First mention of this. And so even to this day, we would, we would be called Christians. We, we are Christians and meaning those ones who follow Christ. We're followers of Christ, followers of Christ's doctrine, etc. And, and by the way, that word today really doesn't mean exactly what it meant in the scriptures. Got to get amen on that. Uh, I, I've met people many times who call themselves Christians, but in turn they would deny the very tenets of our faith. They, they would not even believe that Jesus was God. That's pretty important if you're going to be a Christian. In fact... You can't be saved unless you believe that, the Bible says. Uh, they would call themselves a Christian, but yet they believe that salvation, salvation is something that a man has to do, that he has to work, he has to earn it. Well, Scriptures is very clear that, that if we, we could earn our salvation, then what was the purpose of Jesus dying on the cross? And, and so Christianity, certainly, you can't be a Christian, a, a born-again, born-again uh, Christian, unless... You, in turn, believe salvation is only by your faith and His grace, period. That you must turn, repent of your sin, turn unto Jesus Christ, and cast upon Him your faith for salvation. And so Christianity today makes up perhaps maybe um, close to 2 billion people in this world today. And yet we know that under this banner of Christians, there's a lot of confusion as to what it is, doctrinally, and as I've just stated, that many people that we, we couldn't with good conscience fellowship with because we would not believe they believe correctly. And I'm not talking about, uh, you know, how long or short hair should be. 
I'm not talking about uh, even something maybe that's even a little more personal about whether or not they believe in the King James Bible or some other version of the Bible. Though I think these matters have importance, but a person can be saved and, and know Jesus Christ and, and go to heaven with us, you know, and be in heaven with us and in turn differ with us on standards or maybe even differ with us on minor doctrinal issues. But you can't go to heaven if you believe differently about salvation. And uh, if you believe differently about the deity of Jesus Christ, you, know, you can't go to heaven that way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus said on another occasion, he says, straight is the gate and narrow is the way. The gate is very narrow. And God made it that way because there is only one way that he intends that a man can go into heaven. And that is through the one way of Jesus Christ. And so today, it's a very confusing term. We talk about the word Christians. And it, it today is the universal term that's given. It's a name that really stuck with us. And we oftentimes will say that. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I was witnessing to a man yesterday and he said, I used to be a Christian, but I'm not anymore. I'm, I'm now an atheist. And I said, well, I said, tell me about your, you know, being a Christian. What do you mean by that? And uh, he went on to explain. And I, I said to him, sir, if you, you ever had been a Christian, then you wouldn't be saying that you used to be a Christian. Because you, you can't undo, you can't undo being a Christian. And so... Uh, we had a good discussion about that. And if you think, if it comes to your mind, if you think, pray for this young man, uh, that he in turn, that God would convict his heart um, about salvation. And so when I think about the idea of Christian, which is a word really that has stuck with us. And the word Christian was not a name. The, the Paul and Barnabas didn't stand in teaching and say, all right, today, class, we, we want to give you our last lesson. And the last lesson is you are a Christian. That's what you are. Repeat after me. We are a Christian. Good, good. Let's say it again. We are a Christian. That's what we are. And so when you leave here and everybody asks you who you are, you say, we are Christians. That's who we are. That's not how it came about. It came about not, not from the apostles teaching this or Barnabas teaching this or discipling them. It, it can, didn't come this way. It came by way of those ones who were not believers in Jesus Christ, who were not Christians, that they in turn wanted some way to coin or to phrase or some way to identify those ones who were fanatical or fundamental or those ones who were different to those ones who didn't believe in Judaism, those ones who believed in this Christ. And, and they came up with a term, they're Christians. Perhaps it might have even been a derogatory term. Oh, there goes those Christians. Those ones who... They follow the Christ. They follow His They believe what He believes. And so it wasn't necessarily a term of endearment for those ones that were inside of the church. But that term, and they were so often referenced it, that today we find that term has stuck with us. Look, if you will, in Acts chapter number 5. Because as I was studying on this one day, I got to thinking about it. We, we were called something else before we were called Christians. And, and I, would even, I would even submit to you this morning that, that I would like to rebrand us or rename us uh, and maybe even place back to what our original name was. Not, not that I'm, not that I'm a, a critical of being called a Christian, but it's such a washed out term today. What does it really mean? What does that mean? You know, every, not every, but many politicians will stand and say, I'm a Christian. What does that mean? Explain to me what that means. Acts chapter number five. Are you there? Say amen. amen. Look, if you will, in Acts five and verse number 14, it says, And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. And notice here the scripture says, believers, believers, believers were added. Look, if you will, in Acts chapter four, Acts chapter four, just one chapter back, Acts chapter four and in verse number four. All right. Are you there? Say amen. amen. Albeit. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men were about 5,000. And so here by Acts chapter number 4, you see at the time of this writing, we, we can say conservatively that the church was about 5,000 people big there in, there in Jerusalem, those amount of believers. And here we see that these ones were referred to as believers. They were ones who believed. 
Not only did these men believe, but the Bible says that they heard the Word of God and they believed. That's Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 5, they're referred to as believers. Look, if you will, back in Acts chapter 4 and verse number 4. Uh, again, it says here, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and a number of them, a number of the men were about 5,000, about 5, about 5,000. Believers believe. Isn't that deep? That's good, isn't it? You stick on. You stick around here. I'll teach you a lot of deep things. Believers believe. And it sounds so quaint, but think about it. Believers believe. And these believers, they believe, but the Scripture doesn't just leave us with that. You know, as I read a, an autobiography of one, one famous uh, athlete who said, I have faith. And I read the article. I thought, well, this is going to be a good book. And I read the book, and the person went on to say, I have faith. I have faith and faith. And my faith is in faith, and faith in this, and faith in that, and so forth. And, and the whole chapter, and, 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 in, and in other chapters of the book, this person referred to the faith, but never did this person ever refer to what they believed in. Believers believe, but here in Acts chapter 4, it mentions that they, they not only believe, but they, they heard the word of God, and they believe. Look back chapter number 2, two more chapters back, chapter number 2, okay? So we see they were called believers in Acts chapter number 5. In Acts chapter number 4, just prior to Acts 5, obviously, uh, that they had heard the Word of God, they believed, and this was a result of them being added to the church. So we can deduce from this that believers believe. They believe the Word of God. They hear the Word of God. They receive the Word of God. They believe the Word of God. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. Are you there? Say amen. amen. Let's notice here. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And so here we see that uh, the word of God is preached by way of Peter. They, they heard the word of God, but the Bible says that they received the word of God, meaning they welcomed it. And they, they said, boy, open the door. They opened the door and said, you know, come on in. We went to visit our neighbor lady here. She's here today this morning whose husband just passed away. She lives across the street. And, and before he even got up the steps, she was already opened the door and welcomed us in. She never met me before. I could have been a thief, a robber. I could have been anything. And when you're with Brother Beckett, who knows what you may be, because we know the <laughs> reputation that he has. And, but yet she welcomed us in the house, and we sat down, and we talked, and we fellowshiped, and had a great time. Do you know that a, that a true believer welcomes the Word of God? It wants to, he, he wants to hear the Word of God. A, a true believer is not running from the Word of God. A true believer doesn't sit in church and play with their phone while the Word of God is being preached. A true believer is not someone who, who in turn says, I, I don't really want to know what the Bible says about that. But a believer is someone who says, I wonder what God's Word teaches about that. A believer is someone who says, I want to go to church so I can hear the Word of God taught. A believer is one who says, I want to open the Word of God so I can let God speak to me in my life so that I can know what I need to do, what I need to change, what, what's, what's lacking in my life. A true believer is not one who's looking to Dr. Wiggle Lips to get counsel, but is looking to the Word of God. Because he welcomes the Word of God. He invites the Word of God. He, he wants to hear the Word of God. In Acts chapter number 2, this was, this was the Pentecost day when Peter stands up and he preaches the Word of God. And as he preaches the Word of God, they gladly receive the Word of God. And because they received it, they believed it. They were baptized. They were saved. They were baptized and added to the church by 3,000 people. All right. Look, if you will, in Acts chapter number 8. Acts chapter number 8. Acts chapter number 8. Are you there? Say ma'am. Verse number 14, it says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. And again, we're just, we're just looking at the chronological events of these ones that Scripture calls believers. They heard God's word. They believed God's word. And that, that course of event goes all the way through the book of Acts. 
That's why the book of Acts refers to them as people who believe the Word of God. I want you to turn, if you will, over to 1 Thessalonians, because this is important to note. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul, 1 Thessalonians is written about the count of Acts chapter 17. And Paul was, was led to go into Thessalonica, and there he preached the synagogue for three weeks, and, and there was many devout people that came to Christ. Uh, There's a lot of Jews that fought him, and eventually they chased him out of town, forced him to leave. But the result of this was a church. A great church was established there in Thessalonica. You're in, uh, you're in 1 Thessalonians. Are you there? Say amen. Okay, make sure you're with me. Notice here, if you will, in verse number 13, because Paul's writing. He, he has left. He's in Berea. And Paul is now writing letters back to the church of Thessalonica, these Christians in Thessalonica. And, and he's concerned. He's, he's, he's carrying a legitimate burden. He doesn't want the labor to be in vain. He doesn't want them to be swayed by all the persecution that they are enduring. He knows that their faith, that they are in turn young in their faith, and he doesn't want them to, uh, you know, to, to turn and go back to the lifestyle they had before. And so he's, he's checking on this investment. And I want you to notice what he says here in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And notice what it says in verse number 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. There's a lot to be said out of this verse. Um, well, one of the first things I think of when I read this passage of Scripture was that, uh, that believers, they, believers believe, and, and believers believe the word of God. They welcome the word of God. But here Paul says, I'm thankful that you as a church, you didn't differentiate God's word from our word. But you received it as it was God's word. Now, I would say that, that we have an epidemic today on proportionate levels of preachers who don't preach God's word, but they preach their word. And people who receive man's words as though it is God's words when it isn't God's words. I understand that, that, that in a church, the person who's elevated in a church is God and His words, period. It's not a pastor. It's not a talented singer. It's not a pianist. It isn't, uh, you know, someone who's got money and wealthy. But in the church, it's, the ground is level. We're all abased and low, and Christ is exalted. And, and so we, we understand that God, God in turn, he, that He chooses some people to stand and to teach and to preach the Word of God, and such as I. God chose me. And, and I promise you, He didn't choose me. He, he counted me faithful. Yes, I'm a faithful man, but I'm not worthy. There's other folks in His church that are faithful also, but God didn't call them necessarily to stand and and to preach God's word as he's called me to preach. But understand that, that, that there is no, there's no magic in a preacher. The word of God is where the power is at. And, and so when I read this passage, I, I, the first thing I think about is that Paul, Paul is identifying. He said, I'm thankful that you as a believe, group of believers that when, when I preach the word of God, you received it as the word of God, not as my word. Now, we know this happened at other times because Paul writes to the church of Corinth and he says, some of you say, I am of Apollos and I am Paul and I'm a Cephas and so forth. And boy, do we ever not see that today in Christians. Well, I'm a, you know, I'm a, this kind of believer. I believe what he said. I believe what she said. How about us just believing what God said about? It? How about us minoring on what God minors on and majoring on what God majors on? And by the way, we're not doing too good on the majors that God given us, has given us. He gave us a major of evangelism. He gave us a major of love. He gave us a major of holiness. How do we all know those things? And yet we find that Christianity 
Christianity since the time of Christ has split and splintered because of words of men. Well, let me tell you, there's something to be said in Genesis 1, verses 1, verse number 2. There's something going on there. Oh, did you hear what brother so-and-so, he was just expounding on the word of God. He was telling me all about what's between Genesis verse 1 and Genesis verse number 2. There's a lot to be... He's not telling us what God's Word says. He's telling us what in his brain, his little peon brain, what he's come up with. It's merely a theory. And, and he's taking away and he's making it appear as though it's God's words when it isn't God's words. And people will listen to man's words typically faster than they will listen to God's words. And so Paul's saying, I'm thankful that you received God's words not as though they were my words. But, but the other part of that is that we need to be careful that if we're teaching or we're counseling or if preaching such as I am today, that, that we don't hijack the services, that we don't hijack the opportunity so that we can tell people our words as we stand in the place of where they're listening to hear God's words. Believers believe, and believers believe the Word of God. They hear it, and they gladly receive the Word of God. That's what we're here for. We're here to receive the words of God. And so our boundaries are God's words, to speak God's words as are written. Now, having said that, unbelievers don't. They don't believe the Word of God. Unbelievers don't welcome the Word of God. They don't receive the words of God. They, they don't have God's truth in their hearts. They don't want to have God's truth in their heart. Look, look if you will, in chapter uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, which, which gives us really a, a clear description. 2 Thessalonians in chapter number 2. Are you there? Say amen. Now again, this is the Paul's writing to the, these Christians in Thessalonica. These are new believers and he's checking on their faith and, and they're really being swarmed by people who don't believe the truth of God's Word. And Paul writes about them in, in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause... God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they, should all, that, they should, that, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And we understand that, that the truth here he's referring to is God's word. John 17, 17, thy word is truth. Sanctifying through, through the truth. Thy word is true. We know that truth is. It begins with God and God is defined by His words. And this Bible we hold is its truth. It's God's words. But for you and I today, it is truth. It is the only thing that we know that is true in this world. Amen. This young man I was speaking, just witnessing to yesterday, he, he said to me, I asked him, how, how did this begin? This, this journey of atheism. And he said, well, he said, I, I was in church and I was faithful and and I was debating the Word of God with people, and, and he said, I was really a hard nose. And he said, but I began to see what I thought were inconsistencies in the Bible. And I asked people to, to help me to understand them. I didn't like the answers, and I didn't like the attitude. And he said, once I saw one inconsistency, I saw another one, another one, another one. And he said, then I began to understand that, that how could this even be true? You know, this was something that man has put together and, and man made all of this. And in turn, people are believing it for whatever reason they're believing it. Perhaps so they have a, have a right or reason for them to live good and be good to people. And I don't need that anymore. And he said, I, I've really determined that atheism is a best definition as opposed to the God and a creator. And so I thought that was interesting. The Bible says the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. You know what a fool is? A fool is don't talk to me. I don't care. I don't care that if 1,000 people before me drove down that road and they flew off the cliff because there's no bridge. I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's a fool. A fool in turn is a person who looks facts straight in the eyes and knows truth but absolutely denies it because they don't want to believe it as a fool. I'm not insinuating that this young man is a fool. Um, he, he certainly was, he listened and uh, he was compassionate. I mean, he was interested. Uh, confused, yes. A and the church that he had been a part of did not teach the gospel. They would not teach that salvation was by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And so I feel confidently there's never been a time that he's, he's understood 
was salvation and accepted Christ as a Savior. And so he's tried to make reason. He's supposed to living as a Christian when he never was a Christian. He was trying to force himself to live a life when he didn't have a reborn spirit within. And so this, this end result of atheism is, is to be expected. If you're telling yourself and everybody else is telling you you're a Christian when you're not a Christian, and yet you have all this confusion and you don't have grace and you, you lack so many things, you don't have God's spirit work in your life. But here we see the scripture makes it very clear that, that these folks that are unsaved, uh, these uh, unbelievers, if you will, that they, they have a hatred for the truth. They, they won't, don't want to receive the truth. They, they reject the truth. They uh, are, um, uh, want nothing to do with the truth. Look, if you will, in chapter, uh, chapter 2 again, verses number 10, 11, and 12. Just read a couple more verses. It says here, um, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. And so unbelievers, they don't believe. And if an unbeliever were to believe, he would be saved. He then would be a believer. An unbeliever doesn't believe, and so he rejects the truth. And because he rejects the truth, he rejects salvation, the, the securing of his soul. And the Bible says here in verse number 12 that he's damned. Can I, can I just stop for a moment and say, my wife and I got in the car yesterday and I, I said, said to her, I said, this young man told me he's an atheist. And uh, her first response was, you know, what he believes about God doesn't change who God is. What he believes about God doesn't change what's going to happen to him. I mean, you, you can go on and, and believe what you want to believe. But the fact that you choose to believe something doesn't mean that it is true and will not change truth. Uh, and I've said to him in a car, I said, uh, called his name. I said, you know, I said, one of us are right and one of us are wrong. I said, something is true. I said, it's absolutely impossible for both of us to be right. Has he ever stopped to think about that? And so <clears throat> this, uh, this idea that people will deceive themselves into believing, uh, not believing God's word, not believing the account of salvation, not believing that he's the creator of God, not believing that he died on the cross and rose again three days, so that he could pay for your sin and conquer death for you and provide for you to home in heaven, that doesn't change the fact that God is the creator, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead. It doesn't change any of that. And you can go on and on and on and believe what you want to believe about whatever you want to believe, but it has no bearing on reality, on truth. But many a people that have uh, witnessed to many a people that they, they, uh, Oh, I believe in God, but they, they obviously don't really believe that the account of salvation is, is for them or it's true. Or they, they've separated themselves from, from this, this teaching of salvation. And, and I was witness to a man once and I, he said to me, yeah, I believe in God and I, I believe in heaven and I, and I believe I'm a sinner. And, I believe, and he's just on, he was agreeing with everything. I went through the gospel and asked him, I said, well, I said, you believe in God? He said, yes. I said, well, you believe what I've showed you in the Bible is true? He said, yes. I said, okay. And what's keeping you right now from bowing your head to trust Christ as your Savior? Well, you know, big decision. Yeah, it's a big decision to decide whether or not you want to burn in hell for all eternity as opposed to go to heaven. That's a big decision. Well, he said, uh, 
you know, I, I just, I don't know if I'm ready. And uh, he made more excuses. And, and I knew, I knew he wasn't going to get saved. So, well, he was not going to trust Christ. So I made him, I, I made him, I, I made him, I made him waller, or not waller, but fidgety. I made, I made him try to explain himself. And he, he said a lot of things that was ridiculous. And then I finally I asked him, I said, sir, I said, let's imagine that a bus is barreling down the road. You know, in, there in Nicaragua, we had a lot of buses. And I said, your little two-year-old daughter is in the middle of the road and you see this bus coming. And you know that if you don't do something, if you don't do something, then your child is going to be ran over by the bus and killed. You know that you have to do something or that child has no opportunity, no chance for life. And your response is, that's a big decision. That's a big decision. You know, that's got to think about that, you know. I mean, I'm just not sure if now's the time for it or... You know, I mean, I, I believe, I believe that's really true. I really believe that she's going to get ran over by a bus, but I just don't know that I'm ready to take care of her right now. The man got very upset with me. And I said, sir, what I'm trying to prove to you is that you really don't believe. Because if you really did believe, I said, then you would call upon Christ for salvation. See, unbelievers don't believe. And I remember vividly, as I'm sure many of you do, the day that I came to Christ, I had heard salvation many times. I didn't understand it and completely. And, and then that particular day in December of that year, I was in church and the preacher was preaching and the Spirit of God was just tugged and drew me. And I, I went forward during the service and, and one of the deacons sat down with me, opened God's Word up, and he began to show, for, show to me how that I was a sinner. I'm like, well, I don't have a problem with that. I know I'm a sinner. You know, I know that. And, and, and he explained what sin was, that I had broken the laws of God, that, that I was guilty of, of disobeying laws that God had written. And then he began to explain to me that not only, not only have I broken God's laws, but God says, teaches, that I have to pay for all the sins that I committed. And there is only one payment, and it isn't going to church, giving money, getting baptized, changing your life. That's not the payment. That the payment is that you in turn have to die and be separated from God into everlasting punishment, which is hell in the Scriptures. And there you will stay for all eternity, and that is a payment for sin. And someone would say, boy, that's harsh. Yes, it is. And that's the reason why our God became man and walked amongst us because He loved us and He did not want us to suffer that death. He did not want us to be separated from Him for all eternity. And He went to a cross and He died and paid for sins that He never committed. But He died and paid for your sins, your lust, your stealing, your lying, your murder, your adultery. He paid for your sins. He bore your shame because He loves you and that He went to a grave and rose again provided for you payment of sin and eternal life and all you have to do Marty is say yes I believe and I said that's no problem I got on my knees that day and I prayed and I said Lord I know I'm a sinner and I know I deserve hell according to the Bible what I've seen I believe it and I, I know I deserve hell and I said Lord but I believe that you died for me that you love me and you want me to go to heaven I want you if you'll take me. I want to be saved. And that day I got up off my knees. And I didn't know anything about anything, honestly. I didn't understand anything about anything. But I knew I was saved. Yeah. I believed. Yeah. I didn't go to church for probably a year. And uh, not because I was rebelling. I, my family didn't go to church. When I was with my grandma, she'd take me to church. And, uh, but the youth pastor... Youth, uh, he was a lay youth pastor at the church, and uh, he'd gone back through the decision slips and saw my name, calculated that I was a teenager, and he went looking for me. He knew I was Bertha's son, grandson, and uh, he found me. Knocked on my door one day, and he said, I'm, I'm David. He said, I came by to talk to you. I invited him in the house. He sat down, and he said, I want to tell you about being saved. I understand, I hadn't been in church for a year. I hadn't read my Bible. I don't know, he even prayed. And uh, he began to take me through the Bible, and I said, I'm already saved. He said, well, let's go to a basketball game on Friday night. I went to a basketball game on Friday night. He's bringing me back home. He said, Marty, I'd like to talk to you about being saved. He witnessed to me again. I said, I'm already saved. Sunday, he witnessed to me again. He said, Marty, I want to talk to you about it. I said, I'm already saved. He said, how do you know you're saved? I said, I'm telling you, I know I'm saved. 
I believe. You see, who we are as people is we're believers. We heard the Word of God. We received the Word of God. We believed. Uh, look, if you will, in First, uh, first Thessalonians, back First Thessalonians chapter number 3. I won't segue to this, but uh, in my notes I had written a little bit about the, um, the seed in the sower. And, and I'll ask you something for you to meditate on. The sower goes out and he throws the seeds. Four grounds. Hard ground, thorny ground, rocky ground, and the good ground. By the way, only one of those grounds represent a person who got saved. But the Bible says that of those four grounds, three of them, they've received it until the sun came up. And when the sun came up, you see that, that in two of those other grounds, two of the three grounds, that the seed was killed. But in one, they received it. And they allowed it to take root. And then it took shoot. And then it showed fruit. You see, it represents a true believer. Because what makes you who you are is not your persona. It's not your heritage. It's not anything physically. What makes you who you are is your belief. You've heard God's Word, and you believe God's Word. You believe it about salvation. But see, that's the point of the message is that it doesn't stop there. And my question is to you today, are you still a believer? And I'm not asking if you've been saved. I'm asking you, are you still a believer? Are you still one that hears God's Word, believes God's Word? You're still one that hears God's Word, welcomes it, invites it, and you believe it. 1 Thessalonians 3, all right? Are you there? Say amen. amen. Uh, verses number 9 and verse number 10, Paul says, For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your, for your sakes before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect <clears throat> that which is lacking in your faith. I was having devotions in the morning. I read that phrase, reading over this, and and, and <clears throat> with what current understanding, or at that time, the understanding I had of Thessalonians. And I thought, it's interesting that Paul says, I'm, I'm writing this letter back to church. And he said, I really want to perfect uh, what is lacking in your faith. And, and, and as I was thinking about that, I thought, it's interesting that Paul, he didn't mention uh, anything about their, their meeting location. And I know buildings weren't mentioned a lot. But man, a lot of buildings are everything today in the Christian church. Everything. And it really has become our persona, our icon, our identity has really has become the building. And I'm not against it. I, I, I think that, you know, I, I think that you need a building. I don't want all of you to come to my house. Can I get amen on that? <laughs> and um, it's, um, we did that in Nicaragua. We had church in our house for quite a while. And... Um, you know, you got to put everything away and you got to clean everything and, you know, all that sort of stuff. I kind of like the fact that, that you're not coming to my house to have church. I kind of like that. Uh, and so I like this idea of us all meeting in one place and having church. I think that's good. But, but Paul doesn't talk about the building. He doesn't talk about their program. Um, again, it's something we, we, we identify with. We identify with our building. A building is a necessary evil. We identify with our program. A, bit, a program is just a, it's just a vehicle, it's just a means to an end. That's all. There's no right program. The, the right program is the one that, that's not biblically wrong. You know, as I read about that lady in the newspaper who's a, she is a stripper for Jesus. And she literally, I mean, I was reading an article about it. I would say that's a wrong method. I would say that that's probably not a right method. And she's justifying it. Now, you certainly can get a lot of people's attention, you know, if you start stripping 
for Jesus. You probably get a lot of people's attention, but I don't think that's the right way to preach the gospel. You know. Um, and so, um, but the program, it's the means to an end. He doesn't talk about the building, he doesn't talk about the program, he doesn't talk about their numbers. Uh, he doesn't talk about how large the church was or how small that it had become. Or it, it just no things not mentioned. And it's not to say that those things don't have priority importance in some level. It's just that it wasn't most important, and it certainly wasn't Paul's concern. Paul was concerned about one thing. How's your belief? He said, I want to perfect, I want to perfect what's lacking in your faith. And you know, can I say to you, that's really what parents do to children. That's really what, what leadership in a church does to, to others. That's what disciplers do to those ones, the disciplees, is they... They're there to help make perfect, mature, complete their faith. And so it's, it's perhaps more application specific because faith is really not, your lack thereof is not really identified until you're going through a situation. And th then it's really seen that you don't believe God in that area. I remember... Uh, my wife and I moved to, to California to start a church. Um, I wouldn't, I, not, I, I know that God led me the way that he led me this time, that particular time. And we stepped out and, um, and believing God had led us to do what we're doing, and, but not having any um, financial backing. And I uh, I had a church that had called me, uh, my wife's pastor, and he said, Marty, he said, my church wants to help you and we want to support you. And we were, had already taken off and were moving to California. And it was very gracious. I was so thankful. I didn't actually ask him to, but he said, we're going to support you $500 a month. And, um, and so I was happy, very happy. And so we, uh, <clears throat> and he said not only that, but he said we rented, uh, or we took up a love offering in the church. And he said, uh, so we wanted to give you money, help you with your moving expenses. And he gave me enough money so that we could, it paid for all that moving across country, the gas and renting of a U-Haul and so forth. And, and I thought, well, this is good, you know. I, I'm, I'm here in town, and everything's paid for today. Uh, but nothing's paid for tomorrow. And uh, we made it into an apartment and we got a place to live and I, I found myself getting up every morning and taking a piece of paper and taking a pen and I'd sit down and I'd figure out my bills. This is what I got to pay for and this is what I need and I think how am I going to get that money? And, um, and I, I knew. I knew that I, I knew I was doing what I was supposed to be doing and I'm telling you I knew that God told me not to work a job. And I told my wife that. I said I know God doesn't want me to work and I, I'm not afraid to work. I, I like to work. But I knew that God didn't want me to. I knew that God had called me and wanted me to trust him. <clears throat> and so I'm fretting and worrying about this and fretting and worrying about that and so forth. And there's a lot of good stories, that, good things that happened on that time where God was teaching me. Uh, but every day was a train wreck for me. Every day. I mean, I got out of bed every day and I just, it was a train wreck. How am I going to pay this? What are we going to do? How are we going to put food on the tables? You know, we... We were sleeping on the floor. We didn't have mattresses. We, we, uh, we, we just had some things. My wife was six months pregnant. You know, we didn't have insurance, and I'm worrying about all this. Just a, it was a train wreck. And uh, then I would begin to condemn myself and say, you know, what kind of husband are you? What kind of idiot are you to move across country like this? You know, in this kind of condition, not pre ill prepared, and so forth. And and uh, one particular morning, I was reading, and God spoke so clearly to me from His scriptures. I mean, it was almost as though that the Lord said, Marty, thus saith the Lord to you. And uh, that day I got on my knees and I said, Lord, I'm, I'm done. I, I'm done. I'm, I'm choosing to believe. And I took those papers and I watered up and threw them in the trash. And I said, Lord, I'm not even going to look again. I, I'm not even going to check my bank account. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to, uh, when money comes in, then whatever money comes in, then I'll just take that and write out a check and pay for whatever I can pay for on that day. I said, but I'm going to trust you. I'm, I'm believing in you. And <clears throat> you say, what happened? We starved to death and we died. You know, that's what happened. 
uh, <clears throat> God was faithful. But, but that's what I mean by application specific. That, that yeah, do you trust? Oh, yeah, I trust God. You believe God is fighting? Oh, yeah, I believe that. I believe it. All right. But um, I was there, there in that circumstance to where it wasn't no longer words. But it had to be actions. And I tell you, I was... Hmm. It was difficult. Another occasion, we had something happen with our family, and so many times I've preached to people, trust God, trust God, believe in God, trust God, believe in God. And then we had a tragedy happen with our family. And I was bankrupt. Just bankrupt. My faith was just seemed as though it was just empty. I had nothing left. And God used this lady. I don't know if the lady was even a saved lady. Uh, she was a nurse in the hospital, and she, she rebuked me so strongly. And I went back to God's words and began to read, and God gave me something from His words. But listen, this is what God was saying to me. He was saying, Marty, are you a believer or not? Do you believe? This is not the church of common sense. We're a church of believers. And we, we are ones who have chosen to believe God. To believe God more, more than circumstances. Believe God more than sicknesses. To believe God more than, you know, what, what's happening in the political winds. To believe God more than our feelings. To believe God more. We, we believe God more. And how do we know? We know because of His words. I went through a time to where I began to wonder, is, does God really love me? And a preacher friend of mine rebuked me so sharply. He said, you know, he said, what are you doing? God said in his words that he loves you. Aren't you a believer? And I ask you today, aren't you a believer? Do you believe God's words? And God's words doesn't, it doesn't always come to us in a way that's really palatable. At times we'll read it and it's hard because our culture has trained us in a way. Our thinking, you know, from how we were raised in our family traditions, it's a certain way. And we read scriptures and it's hard for us to adapt to that. Well, you don't understand. My family wasn't this way. We didn't think this way. We didn't act this way. You don't understand in America or in Nicaragua or wherever, they, they, they say these things. That's I understand. But my question is, are you a believer? Are you? And so the fact that I'm a believer changed how I act in my home. The fact that I'm a believer, it changed how I behaved as a person and how I carried myself in public. The fact that I'm a believer, it changed in the things I got involved with and activities. The fact that I'm a believer, it changed what I listen to. It changed how I speak. It changed my activities. It changed me. God's word. I heard it. I received it, I believed it, and it changed me. Are you a believer? I'm going to close my Bible with this to make sure <clears throat> I don't continue on. But um, If you read the book of Jude, uh, in the book of Jude there's some in verses 14 and verse 15, it talks about Enoch. And actually, it actually, the writer of Jude actually writes verses, phrases that came out of what we know to be the book of Enoch, which is an extra biblical book. It's not an inspired book. But there is an extra biblical book. It's called the book of Enoch that, that has contains writings uh, by Enoch about in his life's journey and, and reveals prophecies that was given to him by God. And uh, we understand by the scriptures and also by these accounts that, that God came to Enoch and, and God gave prophecy to Enoch. He revealed to Enoch that there would be a destruction upon the world, what we now know to be the flood. And, and in conjunction to that, God gave Methuselah. And in the prophecy, as, as was explained, 
as Enoch explained it, that, that God pronounced that Enoch, Enoch is the symbol of mercy. It's a symbol of, of, of my, my mercy on the human race. He said, but at the day of Enoch's or, or Methuselah's death, he said, judgment's going to come across the face of the earth. You can trace the timeline and we understand that the flood took place right in conjunction months around the time of Methuselah's death. He didn't die in the flood, but he died right before the flood. Now, what does all that mean to us? Well, it means a lot. It means our God's very merciful. It means that, that 1,000 years, 969 years before he destroyed the world in Genesis chapter number 5, 1,000 years before he destroyed it with the flood because the wickedness was so great, 1,000 years before, you get that, he determined, I'm going to destroy the world because of its wickedness. We look at Genesis chapter 5 and we say, on this day, these people deserve the judgment of God. No. 1,000 years before that, God said, on this day, I've determined the wickedness is so great, I'm going to destroy it. Now, what does that mean to us? Well, <clears throat> can you imagine living? I mean, here's Enoch. The Bible says that, he, that Methuselah was born, Genesis chapter 5, and he, be, he walked with God. What he received in prophecy, what he got from God was so great that his life, he, he became such a believer that the Bible identifies that he walked with God. He gave himself to know God. Now here's the point of it. Never has been a time of wickedness in this world as in the time that I'm referring to this time, from the birth of Methuselah to the flood. Enoch didn't have a Christian radio. Enoch didn't have an iPod. Enoch wasn't, Enoch wasn't able to, you know, turn on his little digital device and listen to the Bible on tape. In fact, Enoch didn't even have a Bible. Enoch couldn't listen to his favorite singing group, you know, that we would listen to in our car traveling. All the literature books that he would read to strengthen his faith, studies on this, studies on that, etc., etc., those things he didn't have. Now, he had words of God, but what he had was he had belief. You see, Enoch was a believer, and he walked with God. Today, we're, we're swimming, we're swimming in Christian TV and Christian movies and Christian music and Christian radio and Christian books and Christian this and Christian that and so forth. We have an epidemic of people who don't believe. You see, you're, you're not, you're, you're not a, a Christian or a believer because you have all those things around you. You're a believer because you've heard God's words, you received them, and you believe them. You live it. And Enoch heard God's words, and he believed them, and he lived them. And so I ask you again, are you a believer? Or are you one that's ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth? Are you one who hears the word of God? You welcome it, you want to hear it, and you receive it, and you believe it. God said it. And if he said it, we know that our God cannot lie. Right. And we know that our God has the power to do whatever he said. And so I, I'm just going to trust him. I like what the one preacher said. He said, when I got saved, I told God, Lord, he said, I know I'm a sinner and I, I know that you died for me on the cross and I believe that. And he said, I'm asking you today to save me. And he said, if I go to hell, I'm going to go to hell believing in you. You see, God, God wants you and I not to be Christians. He wants you to be a believer. Are you believing?
Father, we are grateful and we pray that you would help us uh, to be believers. We're thankful. As I was witnessing to that young man yesterday, I, I was just thankful that, that I believe in you, that I'm saved. Lord, I'm, I, don't, I don't know. I don't even want to think about not having you as my God and my Savior, my Lord. I'm so glad that the Word of God came to me. I'm so glad that in turn I chose to believe, and I didn't even know what I was doing. I didn't even know, but I chose to believe. And I pray, Lord, that that same childlike faith that I had as a child or as a teenager, that that childlike faith will be just as real in me today. That when the Word of God comes to me, that I'll, I'll hear it and receive it, and, and I'll just believe it. I'll just believe it because you said it. I'll just believe it. It just, oh Lord, help me to be a believer. Help us, Lord, to be believers, not Christians. With a head bowed eyes.